Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. Great to be with you this week. Please welcome back our guest, David L. Gray. David is an American Catholic theologian and historian and the president and publisher of St. Dominic's Media. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Central State University and a Master of Arts in Catholic Theology from Ohio Dominican University. He and his wife, Felicia, are active at the Queen of Peace Catholic Community on Scott Air Force Base. And he's a radio personality for the Guadalupe Radio Network with a show titled The David L. Gray Show, Voicing Truth and Reason, which airs every Wednesday on the Global GRN Network at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. David, how you been? Man, William, it's happy to be a pleasure. I'm happy to be back. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. I, I thank you so much for coming back on. Yeah, I've been keeping track of your stuff. I watch all your videos. And one of the things that you've done recently is these mass nightmares. <laughs> and I, full disclosure, sometimes I watch them at four o'clock in the morning. And sometimes it wakes me up more than coffee. Uh, <laughs> some of the stuff that's happening out there. But yeah, what I wanted to do today is I asked you to come on so we can just discuss the liturgy about it. You know, maybe break down parts of the liturgy. Mm. what we can do as what we can do as Catholics to fully participate more in the liturgy and the importance, as you say, of following the black, or I mean, saying the black and doing the red. But before I do that, I wanted to plug your book on the liturgy, the divine symphony, which is great. You can get it over on Amazon guys, check it out. It's a great book. David breaks down the liturgy in a lot of detail. And if you have Kindle, if you have Kindle unlimited, it's free. So, David, I mean, you've been, you've been very busy. You've been doing a lot of stuff out there. But wh why do you have such a passion for the liturgy? Um, the liturgy changed my life. I mean, from the first time I walked into a Catholic Mass, had no idea what to expect. I um, had never even watched it on EWTN. I just knew that um, Protestantism had, had a, a thing failed me, and it was, it was off. There was something that was... There had to be something better here, right? It had to be, this didn't seem like it was what um, what God had ordered, what Jesus Christ had established through his apostles, right? It seemed random, spontaneous, extemporaneous at, at sometimes. It, it, so it was, but so um, I, I knew and I had found out enough about Catholics. I knew that they were older than Protestants. I didn't know how old before I walked into the mass. Right. So not know, knowing anything what to expect, but when I walked in, I knew it was completely other. I knew something that was going on here in this small space. I knew that something other, it was other. It was completely different. It was silent. It was solemn. And it, if, it seemed to me to be worship, right? And it was order. It was ritual. It was mystery and mystique at the same time. It was, it was odor without being um, difficult, right? It was, mm -hmm. it was. It was everything. And um, so from that point on, I just knew I was home and I knew I had to be this, whatever this was. I wasn't for sure. But and so what I what I've and so it just made a big impact on my on my life. And what I've been trying to do then since therefore thereafter was try to learn how to live my life liturgically, because I think the mass and we'll talk about that. I think the mass has everything there to help us become saints. And so that's my reason. I mean, that's how I try to structure my day. And so that's what I mean. It's just changed my life. Okay. Now, for those that may not be familiar, familiar I can't talk today, apparently. Um, can you go through some of the various parts of the mass, like liturgy of the word, et cetera, and maybe what we can do to participate more fully in those? Yeah, 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 for sure. I'm not bringing my notes here just to make sure I don't, I don't miss anything. Right? <laughs> there's a lot there for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, so, I mean, there, there's obviously there's, there's four parts of the mass and that's, you mentioned my book, divine symphony. And that's what I call it a divine symphony because there's four parts of a classical symphony orchestra. Mm. And when I look at people like some of the great composers who are Catholic people like Hayden, the father of the symphony orchestra, people like Mozart. I, I see how the mass influenced their life and how when it went on to influence their music. So, so the liturgy has these four parts. It has an, an opening rite, which, we, which is a, a penitential rite. Mm -hmm. And then it has a, a liturgy of the word and then a liturgy of the Eucharist, which has many parts in it. 
And then the fourth part, which a lot of people dismiss, which I think is perhaps the second most important part of the liturgy, is the concluding rite, the, dis the dismissal. And, and so what, what's going on, and you would ask a lot of people, like, okay, when does the mass begin? Some people may say, well, it begins with the sign of the cross, or it begins with the opening procession. What the church is taught in general structure in the Roman Missal is that the mass begins in silence. Right. Mm. And it's important that it begins in silence because let's go back to the symphony orchestra analogy again, which I think is the best analogy. It eventually falls apart, but I think it's the longest sustaining analogy. I think look, let's look at the, the symphony orchestra. What happens? What's going on there? How does it look like the world? Well, when you come into a symphony orchestra, first, what's going on, what you may hear is it's a bunch of chaos. People are moving around, people are getting seated, but then you look at the stage. The, the, the cover may be down, the curtain may be down. And what's, but what's going on there? You hear a lot of noise, music, instruments playing different paces, different sounds. It's a cacophony is what it's called. It's a cacophony, it's ordered, it's structured. It's not a symphony. This is like the world, right? The world yes. that we live in, it's a cacophony. It's noisy, right. it's loud, it's racket. There's no order. There's no peace. But what God is calling us to is what? Silence, mm -hmm. to listen to him, that quiet. And so that's where the mass truly begins. I think that's very important. Because like you said, we're, at least in my house, we have four kids. So sometimes getting ready for mass is a very hectic affair. Okay. <laughs> so we're, getting, we're running around, we're running around. But as soon as we walk in, it's quiet. Everything chaotic is outside. Now, this is a time to concentrate on God. Now, after, now when, the, when it comes to the penitential rite, and I've heard this, I saw this just on Twitter a couple days ago, that there's no substitute. No, some, some people will say that the penitential rite is like a substitute for confession. Mm. Now, obviously, that's not the case, but what, why is that the case, though? Yeah, so during a penitential rite, um, so what we're doing, the whole penitential rite is really preparing us for receiving the word of God, right? So it, it is fitting that not only, so before you receive the word of God as the whole Eucharist, is we should be without grave sin, okay? Yeah. Um, so, but before we leave, re hear the written word of God, the audible word of God, the written word of God, we still should be without without sin not grave sin right but we should be properly disposed to receive the word of god so that it may be so that it may penetrate us because what's holy cannot penetrate what is sinful so what's going on with the penitential right is that we're confessing our sorrow and the priest is saying a lot of prayers of what's called sacramental absolution is so it's not it's not sacramental. It's not. It's, it's, it's non-sacramental ab absolution, rather, meaning that a sacramental ab absolution, a complete forgiving of our sins, would be the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. That's when mm -hmm. our our sins are forgiven, right? If we made a good confession. So, but what's going on with the priest? What the priest is saying during the penitential rites, his prayers of sacramental absolution, they only. Um, forgive us of venial sins. It's still preparing us. It's still getting us ready to have the word of God penetrate us. It's still those who have committed, haven't committed grave sin, but may have some venial sins. It's still getting them ready for the Holy Eucharist. It's still preparing us. But we have to always make the distinction that going to the penitential rite is not the same as going to confession. Not at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So get to confession whenever you can, folks. It's it's there. It's there for it's to help us get to heaven. So let's just take advantage of it. Now, when we get to the readings, what's the significance of the readings? Because you and I used to be Protestant, and maybe sometimes we'll have three or four verses, and you know there'll be this forty-five minute sermon on it. So what what's the big deal about the readings? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing how to, how the Protestant preachers will take one line like "One thus saith the Lord." And they'll talk about it for like forever, an hour or more. <laughs> I, I think that's phenomenal. But yeah, <laughs> it is. Really, it really, it is. <laughs> but so, 
the reading sort of lures you to word, man. It's really rooted way back in what is it, Kings or Chronicles with Ezra. The, the book of the law had been gone for a long time. So Ezra and a priest, they bring it back before the assembly of God. And I forget what verse it is in the, in, in the Old Testament, but it looks just like the mass. Um, there's an altar that's constructed. There's the people when the law is being read for the first time in a long time, the people prostrate themselves. And then after the law has been written, the text says that the other, the other priests, they took time explaining it to the people what they had heard. And then afterwards, there's a feast. So we see this type of, we see the liturgy of the word and this type, this prototype of the mass way back in the Old Testament with the Jews. And, and then early on, we, we see it, we see samples of it in the New Testament with Paul. And then we see it in, the, in the early tradition, especially Justin the Martyr, he's the, right. probably the most famous for writing this when he wrote that letter to an emperor trying to explain what Catholics do. And so what's going on here? Well, during the liturgy, litur there's two things that's going on through the liturgy, right, William? There's either praying or confessing. That's it. People think we're doing a lot of different things. The church calls the mass the highest form of prayer. True. But what, what we're doing there, our participation in it is in two ways. We're praying, we're confessing, and we're doing it in four different postures, you know, standing, kneeling, um, sitting, so I guess that's three, standing, kneeling, sitting, sitting right? Standing, mm -hmm. kneeling, sitting, right? In the Eastern traditions, it'd be standing and sitting, right? right. So, so two things we're doing three different ways for the Latins. And so where, do, where does the liturgy of the word fit in at it? Is it a prayer? Is it a confession? It's a confession. A confession of who? Not us. It's a confession of God's love for his people. He's confessing us, mm -hmm. his love for us throughout salvation history. So. In a typical solemn mass, you would have the first reading, a second reading, or first reading a psalm, a second reading in gospel. And the in the in in the, in, the, in the psalms is is also a confession of love, but it's also the church has structured it as, as a call and response, right? So God confesses his love for his people, and we respond to that love. Mm -hmm. And so and there we see an element throughout the mass called the call and response, which is important. So the call and response, remember when we were Protestants, the preacher would say something random and we'll say something random, like preach that word or yay. You know, we say something weird, but it's true. You know, that's right. Yeah, or something <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that. yeah that's, <laughs> that type of stuff. But in a church, this is divine language. So the church has given the priest what to say and has given us what to say. So it's not our words like it was when we were Protestants, but it's the words of the church. The words of the church have found to be beneficial for our salvation. So, and this is what happens, you know, typically in, in, um, in, in, the, um, in the new order of rites. And, and I, I would say that the older rites also had this call and response, but oftentimes it's typically between a priest and also serve a priest and a deacon. But right. in a novice order, there's a lot of call response with, with the people as well. Um, that, you know, is more, 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 common there what we say but in numbers in numbers wise i think there's more in the older rights but in in what it appears to be with the people there's this there's this in in the divine in the symphony orchestra it's called periodic phrasing it's when one group of instruments will play a melody and another group of instruments will respond right so there in the symphony is this call and response between the instruments but what's this dialogue between the priests and the people is 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 very important throughout the mass because God is speaking to us and we're responding. And this happens as well in the liturgy of the word when we hear God confesses for his love for his people through the inspired word and we respond back. And so that's what we've been prepared for and um, in the liturgy of the word. And, but why is it important? Why, 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 why is that the structure? Why are we there now? Why didn't we mm -hmm. just start with the Holy Eucharist? Why don't we just start in the beginning of the mass? Just, just give us the Holy Eucharist. Give us Jesus Christ. Um, like I said, give us Barabbas, right? No, give us just from the beginning. Just give us Jesus Christ and let's be done with it. No, there has to be a preparation. Why does it have to be, be a preparation? Because that's salvation history. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus Christ didn't come, right? They're, they had to be prepared. They had to receive the word of God and they had to respond to the word of God. Then they were prepared. So that, that's why all this is going on, this call and response this being prepared through the penitential rite, 
just being prepared by hearing the word of God, letting it penetrate our hearts, right? And then right at the end of the word of God, um, we make this confession, right? God has confessed his love for his people through the word of God, um, through, through the text. And then we respond with this creed. In the same, yeah. as the creed says, well, having, the, having heard the word of God, I believe, I believe a God, the Father Almighty. So it's this beautiful, it's this just beautiful trajectory that we're on from the very beginning that began in silence to, to now we're, we're on this, like this ascent of getting prepared and now hearing. We're like, the, we're like the, the children of Israel going to the desert on our way wow. to the promised land. That's amazing. Really, I never thought of it that way. But the, so we we're, we're saying the creed, and then the you know prayers of the faithful are said and all that. And then we go into the liturgy of the Eucharist. Yeah, and yeah. it's pretty amazing the build up, the history of God's love through His people through the readings. And here we are, we're about to receive our Lord and Savior. So what? So for those who may not be familiar, what exactly is happening during the liturgy of the Eucharist? And I say that David because I remember the first mass I ever went to. And I'm like, why is this guy just reading out of a book this whole time? I don't understand it. <laughs> like, so what's going on there? <laughs> yeah. And thank God he's reading out of a book because we saw what happened oh, in that yes. my, mass, mass nightmares <laughs> when they, they don't read out of a book. I mean, yes. strange things can happen. Uh, I used to feel the same way. Like, it's like, because I, when I was discerning to be a priest, I always said, man, if I become a priest, I'm going to have the whole thing memorized. But no, no. You, no. It, it's, it's, I think it's if you set yourself up for failure if you don't just focus with what the church what the church is written yeah so what's going on there is the most unique thing that happens in the entire universe that god who became man so that man may become like god is now going to come again so that man may become like god right and so the priest is going to speak the exact same words that Christ spoke at what we call the last supper at the last Seder ritual or the last Passover meal. What do you want right. to call it? And, and, and the important thing here is that Jesus Christ had to say what he said, because in Exodus, in the second chapter of Exodus, I believe it is God issues what's called a perpetual command to the Jews to celebrate the Passover meal. He, he gives them a description, how to do it, to eat the lamb where to do it, when to do it. Um, and it says, and he calls it perpetual. He says it's a forever command, which means that there's never a time when this isn't going to be a command. The Catholic, Catholics today are only people still celebrating this command or honoring this command, obeying this command. The Jews aren't doing it. They don't have a temple anymore. They don't slaughter lambs anymore. They don't do this. They have something that they call a Seder ritual, but it doesn't involve a high priest um, sacrificing a lamb. So they're not obeying it. The Protestants aren't, the Muslims aren't, the only people that are still obeying that perpetual command that God gave us the night before the Passover are the Catholics. And so this is what Jesus is doing at the, his last Passover meal. He's bringing that perpetual command of God into the new covenant. And he's saying, do this in memory of me. Whereas God gave you this, Father gave you this perpetual command before the Passover out of Egypt. Now I'm giving you this perpetual command on a night before your real Passover out of sin and death. So it's this, this, this same thing that, that, that we see. And so this is why it's important for the priest to say the same words that Jesus says, because he's in the persona of Christ. He's, yeah. he's in the person of Christ at this moment in celebration of sacraments. So, and he's saying what he's saying the same words that, a, um, that Christ said, as the person of Christ, and because that's in place, because he, he is the person of Christ, and he's saying the same words as Christ, the effect is the same, that his words perform what they propose. If, if Christ was physically among us as he was 2,000 years ago, and he told that that, that mountain to move, guess what? That mountain is going to move. If he says, Lazarus, get up from the, raise up from the dead. Lazarus, raise, he gets up from the dead. And so in the same way, the priest says, um, um, the words of consecration, that bread therefore becomes the flesh and that wine therefore becomes 
the body of Christ, his blood, his blood, rather the blood of Christ. And so, and, and this, is, this is, is so essential for, if we get into this, we get into the, in the, into the last movement. But again, what's going on here is that God who became man, so that man becoming like God, become like God, is now in the mass, the only place where this happens in the universe, is becoming bread for us to eat. He's becoming um, drink for us to drink so that we may be what we eat and what we drink, which is him. That's really a miracle that happens every mass. <laughs> uh, re really. I mean, we, th we take it for granted. We really do. But now after that, we go to concluding right now. And a moment ago, you said this may be one of the most important aspects. But sometimes after the liturgy of the Eucharist, maybe some people, you know, go out the door and get, <laughs> go in the parking lot. Yeah. Why, why is this concluding right so important? It's it's the fulfillment of everything. It's it's the great sending. You know, in Latin, you know, it's the etta messa es, go, you are dismissed. And so shame on people who leave, who, who what, what do you call it, eat and run, right? They get the Holy, <laughs> yeah, okay. the Holy Eucharist and they just, they bounce out. Shame. Because, one, you know, you're missing a blessing. There's a blessing that concludes. Hopefully it's not with a guitar. Um, yes, but hopefully, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, there's a blessing that concludes, but really what's going on. If I could bring again, my analogy to symphony orchestra again, the last movement of symphony or orchestra is called a rondo. Oh, the form of it is, is a pace. We would say, so there's, um, um, sonata is one form, allegro is another form, but rondo in, in the classical symphony orchestra is typically the, the pace that's used in the last movement of symphony. So it sounds what the word Rondo sounds like. It's just like, it's rockly, rockly, it's fast paced. It's, it's upbeat. It's like this, this grand finale. It's like on the 4th of July in the United States, we had just the fireworks at the end of the fireworks festival. This is like this boom, 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 boom. And, or we could say it's like, what happens if you've been to the high school pep rally on, you know, homecoming, you know, right before homecoming, the, you know, a lot of high schools have a pep rally for the football team. And it's just this raucous thing. People are just stumping their feet on the bleachers. Like, boom, 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 boom. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's get this. Let's go, let's go beat the team. It's just this big rallying cry for the people. And that's what's really going on during the fourth movement, the concluding rites. It doesn't feel like that. You know, we've gotten the Holy, we see the Holy Eucharist. We're ready for this thing to be over. Some people are looking at the watches. Oh, father, he's, he's a little bit over that homily. He said was kind of long and we know we're just, you know, just kind of ready to go, but you have to embrace what's going on here because this final dismissal with the priest is saying who you have received through the liturgy, go be that in the world. Amen. And so now that we have Jesus in us, we're now empowered to go be like him in the world. And to take what we received in the liturgy into the world and made the world a type of liturgy because everything the liturgy has been teaching us hasn't been for naught. It's teaching us when to stand, when to kneel, when to speak, what to say when we speak, how to say it, how to sing. And, and so every all this thing has been teaching us through repetition every Sunday or every day if you go every day for all your life has not been for naught. It hasn't just been some sort of weird calisthenics. It's been, it's been actually teaching us how to be in the world, how to be reverent, how to give, what to give, it, it, what to read, how to read it. It's, it's been it's been giving us everything, how to be in the world. And so the great hope of the liturgy is that we might leave. The priest might be, dismiss us, go and preach the gospel, and that everything we've been formed to be during the liturgy, we might be that in the world so that the world itself might be a type of liturgy something that's ordered to Christ, something that's oriented to Christ. And so what does this look like? It looks like what happened during the liturgy. How, it, like I said, you can structure your day just like the liturgy. You can wake up with the sign of the cross. You can read the readings. You could be giving. You could, you could share yourself with the world, um, you know, share Christ with the world through mm -hmm. you. It, it just You could shape your workspace to be a type of liturgy. This whole thing is just, just transportable. This is like, like a microwave. You could take it and plug it anywhere. It just, it just works. But typically what happens, you know, when we are dismissed is 
you know, is not that. So we, we like to leave the mask there. I just leave the mask here. I'll get on with back. our lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll come back next week. But when I go to my workspace or where I go to the, into the ballot booth or where I go into anywhere, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, you know, based upon my own human reason, rather than how my father has raised me to be through the liturgy. Yeah, great. What would you say to someone? And our guest today is David L. Gray. And visit his website, davidlgray.info. And while you're there, subscribe to his amazing YouTube channel. Now, David, what would you say to someone who's saying that I'm not getting anything out of the mass? What would you say to them? I would, I would say fine. I think that's you're not you're not feeling anything. Millions of people don't already are, are feeling, but I would say two things. One, that the mass, there's a reason why the mass isn't new to you. New things are fascinating, right? You encounter something new, whatever it is, you get your new car, you watch a new TV show, a new baby. New things are fascinating. It, they, yeah. they draw your attention in. And but so why isn't the mass new to you anymore? So let's talk about that. And so typically what's going on there is some sort of it's like muscle memory, you know, or, um, or some sort of like brain memory. Repetition has become, the masses have, has become quite ordinary for you. And you don't see anything new there. So what we have to do, we have to spend some time um, discovering, making the mass new for you again. So what, what, what that may involve, it may involve going to a new church, a new liturgy, um, but it may involve also, what I, what I would recommend is that you should start paying attention to certain things that's going on during a liturgy and make a mental awareness or some sort of physical awareness. Whenever you hear that thing or see that thing, acknowledge it in some way so that you can stay present, right? Because when we acknowledge things, we, we remain present in them, you know, it could be a spouse, mm -hmm. you know, if you know your spouse is always present, you're always attentive to them when, you know, they move or something, oh, they, they move or they, or they like, it's most, more, most common what happened with a sick person, like, oh, what's, what's going on? I, I should do something, right? Now I should, I should be paying attention to what's going on. So what I do during the mass is whenever I hear the word Jesus, Jesus Christ, you know, I, you know, I, I, I practice the holy name of Jesus. I give my head a slight bow. And that, that keeps me aware, that keeps me attentive to what's going to what's going on. And, and so also, I would say the second thing I would say is that if the math, you're not getting anything out of the mass, then let's spend some time understanding what the mass is and why is mysterious and mystique. Something as simple as the profession, right, William, this procession into the mass. We're talking about a procession that is a participation in the processions of all salvation history that in God, who's in the eternal right now, when he's looking at us processed to the sanctuary, he's looking at that procession in the same way as every procession through our salvation history and eternal right now, our procession to the sanctuary is a procession, pr procession into the crossing of the Red Sea, the procession into the promised yeah. land, the procession of, of David, bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem or the procession of Jesus, to Calvary, these the processions of every mass since for the last 2000 years. Isn't that mysterious? Isn't that great Absolutely. that you're witnessing? You're looking at something, a procession that's just a sharing of participation in all of salvation history, just in these little ways, the mass is just fascinating. This should like make the brain explode. But if you don't know this, the mass is probably one of the most boring places in the entire, in, if anything, you've ever, you probably think a basketball game or baseball game is more fascinating than mass, but it's not. It doesn't even come close. Right. Don't agree more. I want to take a minute to talk about mass nightmares. Okay. Um, so <laughs> how, how did this whole thing start? <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it didn't used to be called mass nightmares. Remember my old poor bad talking Catholic? Remember I used to have this show talking Catholic on my podcast, right. on my YouTube channel. And um, one day, there's this horrible mass that I wanted to talk Catholic about. And so I brought it on and I think it was, I think it was St. Sabina with Flager. I think it was. And so, you know, people were like, oh, so I'll do this again. And so I did a couple more just, and so what I wanted to do was look at the mass and say, okay, this is what these guys did. This priest did during liturgy. 
And I wanted to just look at, okay, what does the church teach? What does what the order of the mass say the mass should look like? What is general right. instruction and missile? And just compare these things two together. And then it turned into this thing where um, people just kept sending me bad masses. And you sent me one recently over on it Twitter. The, it was the guitar yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sent me that one. You did the blessing so with the guitar. People send me right? these things and like, oh man, we got to talk about this. We got to compare this to, we got to learn the good through the bad. So that's what we've been learning. It's a little bit of laughter, a little bit of mocking in there in, in a playful way. Um, but it's mainly showing that what, what pride has done to the liturgy and what in a Norvis order, there, there's some things there. There's a lot of liberties that priests can take. And that's why the Norvis order, I think, is probably one of the most dangerous liturgies for priests, just because there's so much room for him to add himself to it and remove Christ from it. And, and so because that element is there, um, we get some of these things. And I like to say that the mass nightmare I'm going to show pretty soon is not so much of a nightmare as it is just a bad dream. The mass nightmares that we typically see on the show William are, I think, extreme. I don't think that's like, I don't think you find probably one of those in every diocese. No. Um, no. But they're out there. But I think what we typically see is one I'm going to show pretty soon is that um, it looks fine. It, you know, the priest is saying the right thing. He's not adding his own words. But um, even a mass that looks benign like that, it can, we can see how it can be it can be harmful in what some ways because it focuses more on the people in the priest into Christ. And because of that, it's always it's always going to be nightmarish. Recently, my priest gave a class on the mass for our for the RCA class. And at the end of it, he said he called everyone over. He's like, you see these these words. Some of them are black. Some of them are red. He said, my job is to say the black and do the red. And there's a seminarian that's shadowing him right now this summer. And he's like, if you do this, you're going to be a successful priest. Because if you don't, you're going to. These words, when my priest said this, they stuck with my mind. He said, if I don't follow the black and do the red, I'm robbing God's people. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's powerful. And, yeah. So it was pretty powerful. I guess. Why, why is this so important, though? I mean, for people that don't, re don't realize we had the we had the, the the missile there, and of course the black and the red. Why, why does the priest have to do that? Because that's what the church has given him it was to be good for our salvation. So it is under the purview of the church, the pope, to be the shepherd of our salvation. How does how does the shepherd? How does the vicar of Christ? How does and how does his 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 brother bishops? How do they participate in us shepherding and, and leading us to Christ, getting us to heaven? Where church, though Christ gave us the formula, and the church in her wisdom has built the whole, a whole, um, a whole liturgy, which again is is prototyped in the Old Testament of leading and guiding us to salvation. And this is really the the language of a shepherd, right? So, a shepherd is always leading his people somewhere, and but the priest, the shepherd, is leading his pre his people to someone, okay. And so the shepherd um, um, is, in, in this context, um, as, as the priest, has been given by the church, as your father said, your priest said, words to say in black, things to do in red. And when the priest deviates from that by not giving us what we deserve, which is our due, and I'll talk about that real quick for a minute, sure. it is a type of theft and it is a type of robbery. So when we think of justice in a Catholic context, when we think about, okay, what is justice? Well, it's giving the other person their due. Giving the other person their due. Now, why is the liturgy our due? Because through the liturgy, we can say, we can say liturgy is our due. It's what we deserve. Not because we merited it in, in any sort of way, but it's our due because God desires uh, it for us. Because through the liturgy, Christ comes. Right? Right. And so Christ is our ultimate justice. Not because we deserve him or we merit him, because but God found that to be the greatest good, him to be the greatest good for us. He 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 deemed that through his son we may be like him, that being in his son, we may be um everything that he has created us to be. And so Christ is our due. And when when a priest doesn't say the black or do the red, it may in some way 
invalidates the mass itself. So there are people throughout the world going to mass. And because the priest isn't saying the black, as we see with even with baptisms, priests not saying the right words, it can invalidate a whole baptism, invalidate a whole mass. And because of that, um, we haven't received our due. We haven't received what we need for our salvation. And so this is a type of theft. It's, it's, it's a type of grave harm that is done when priests perform a liturgy in such a way that it invalidates it and it harms people and robs them of what they're due. So we, we always have to stay focused on orienting the mass to Jesus Christ because he is our due. He's what we need and because he's what God has given us. Absolutely. Now, one more thing, David, I'll let you go to enjoy your day. And again, I thank you for being with us today. St. Dominic's Media, I guess you re recently put out a new book. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about it? Oh, yeah, it's going to be out in April. April, okay. April, um, so the Monday after Easter, I think that's April 18th or 17th. So it's going to, yeah, I'm excited about it. So I think I talked about this on your, your show before. So it's called Catholic, Traditional, and Black. Things that don't sound like they go together, right? <laughs> so you have about 3 million Catholics in the United States who, you know, the social construct will call them Black Americans. So, um, and so 3 million more, we would say are Catholic. Um, small percentage of them would call themselves traditional in some way, either traditional in liturgy or traditional in devotions or practice of their faith, right? So what, what polls have found out is that the majority of so-called Black Catholics look a lot like Black Protestants in how they vote, how they live their life, um, and what they believe. Um, and so, but so what we're excited about is that there's a that we think the tide is turning, that we see more and more of those who call themselves Black Americans embracing tradition and sense of liturgy. It could be Latin, it could be Byzantine, but also traditional devotions and really embracing a Catholic sense of living your faith and living or living your life, having your life being informed by your faith. So the first principle about your life is not that you have a particular skin color or that your descendants for from a particular place. Mm -hmm. Now, the most thing, important thing about you is not those things that you had no control over. Rather, the most important thing about you is your confession that you are Catholic. And so that's how you're going to, that's, that's everything that influences your life, how you vote, how you live, how you parent, everything is your faith. And oh, by the way, that um, I happen to be a particular skin color, or I happen, you know, my descendants happen to be from a certain place or from a certain time. So this is a collection, this is an anthology of a collection of several Catholics who, who embrace that, that yes, I'm Catholic. Yes, I'm traditional in being Catholic. And yes, I'm Black. And so um, the four is being written by a quite notable um, traditional Latin priest, I'm going to sing Eugene Morris from St. Louis. And um, he's in a, a lot of people may have seen him in the Mass of Ages series. And so he's writing a forward. And we have, I think, uh, seven essays at this point okay. of, of people who, who have some really interesting stories about how they found tradition. Some cradle Black Catholics been Catholics all their life. And then discovered, oh, wow, I, no one told me about this. And then other converts like myself who came into just the church, just Norvis Ordo, but then maybe found a Byzantine, may have found traditional Latin, or really just um, one story is, is a person who is still, you know, Norvis Ordo, but um, is like, I'm fine here liturgically, but I'm going to live my life differently, right? Because my, my faith is going to form everything that I do. So I'm really excited about it. And it's, it's coming at a time that, you know, um, that I think is, is really important in church history, just because of attacks on, you know, some um, or suppression of some traditional yeah. Latin rites. And, and because of, and, and I think largely that a lot of Black Americans are starting to realize that they've been lied to in a lot of ways, you know, from the Protestant religion, from media, you know, and everything is that maybe there's something else out here 
and this something else that's out here has been the story of Black Americans from the very beginning. The first boat that landed in this country in 1565 from Spain had a number of Black people on it, some slaves, some free from Spain. And the first mass that was ever celebrated in this country among Black Americans was from, from a Franciscan priest, and it was the Roman Rite, 1565. Wow. Every Black person who we call Black, who's on the path of sainthood, except for one, Thea Bowman, um, Venerable Father Augustus Tolton, Venerable Pierre Toussaint, Venerable Henriette Delisle, Mother Mary Lane, Servant of God, Servant of God, Gia Greenlee. That was their mass, the traditional Latin mass. So in front of the very beginning from North Africa and Ethiopia that we read it about in the Bible, ancient, the ancient liturgies, that, that has always been the, the mass of people of very dark skin. So perhaps we can reconnect with, you know, our, our roots and discover what has always, what the mass that has mass and the traditions that have made saints out of black folk in America. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that and be on the lookout for that in April. And of course I'll be putting links and all that to the website so they can check it out. But where can, where can our listeners learn more about you? I know we have a lot of crossover between our, our listeners, but for yeah. those that, for those that don't, where can they listen to your stuff? or maybe yeah, reach out to again. you even yeah thanks again for having me on william it's always a pleasure to come on my Pleasure's show happy, yeah <laughs> uh so yeah david l gray that info that's my name david l gray jray dot info is a jumping off site that's my website jumping off to everywhere else but you can just type in david l gray into the google and i, I usually come up all right well david thanks again for your time today god bless you and what you're doing you too william praise be right. to god thank you